All right, everyone, welcome to Trial Site News. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host. Thanks so much for joining in. And today we are going to have a discussion about decentralized clinical trials. Um, some of you may know what that is. Some of you may not know anything, but that's okay. We're going to explain. Um, I'm really excited to have my guest here, and I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves a little bit about the work they do and the companies that they work for. So we have Joel and Allie. Whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Go ahead, Allie. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ali Holland. I'm the executive um, general manager for DCT at Medible. So um, my background is in clinical research, 25 plus years of running clinical trials, both at site and for industry. And really over that time, looking at what are those key um, breakpoints uh, that cause an awful lot of frustration in terms of how we offer patients and sites the ability to collaborate together in the clinical trial environment. And so where Medible attracted me in was really to look at how technology can really be leveraged to, to help improve that and make some transformational changes in how drug development works. Thank Joel, you. Over to you. Joel? Great. Yeah, hi, Joel Morris. I'm CEO of CureVit Clinical Research. Curevit is a two and a half year old company, CRO, focused on executing decentralized clinical trials. And as my background, I founded a company in the late 90s focused on uh, uh, tech enabled services for pharmaceutical companies. I grew that to about a $100 million company and sold that to Merck in 2014. And I stayed on working at Merck for about five years before I went out and got the team back together to start another company focused on Decentralized trials, which is, as Ali said, a really important uh, new initiative and in, or newish and a strong segment uh, in the uh, clinical trial space. Look forward to speaking with you about it. All right, great. Thank you, guys. So we'll have a wealth of knowledge here. Um, now, there's a lot of scientists and researchers who watch the videos on Trial Site News, but there's a lot of people who don't, who aren't in, who aren't in science and. They're, they may wonder, what is a decentralized trial? How does it differ from a traditional trial? And maybe also, how does it differ from a fully virtual trial? So I thought we could start there if someone wants to jump in and answer that question. I'm happy to give it a start. I mean, I think uh, it's one of the big conundrums in the industry is how do we, how do we define decentralized clinical trials? And I think for, for us at Medible, we're really looking at how do we provide um, decentralized choices about how sites and patients engage. Could be that we're collecting and engaging on site, but using digital technology to improve comprehension, to improve um, engagement, to allow for choices that some patients may choose to stay at home, some patients may choose to preferentially always come to site. We're not looking to mandate that, we're looking to give those choices. And so I think as we look across the industry, certainly uh, DTRA as an association is also looking to define this and have got a fairly broad um, new definition that's just been published that is really um, part of the consortium um, response from the industry that really notices that, you know, it's, it's allow about allowing choice, about providing those opportunities for people to engage. So it might be virtual, it might be remote, it might be on site, it might just be in a slightly different community based location. So it's, it's just about, we talk about centralizing to decentralize, centralizing the opportunity with the technology to decentralize the choices about where people want to participate. Thank you. And the, the thing that I would add to that, because I agree with everything that Ali just said, and what I would add to that is a component of what we call a virtual uh, site. And that is that there is trial activity going on, um, typically empowered by the clinical technology, but through a, a virtual location. And that way, um, if they don't, if patients don't wanna go or subjects don't wanna go to a physical site and can leverage what we call the virtual site. And there's a whole host of processes and technologies and um, um, especially regulatory around the, the virtual site. And I think that that's a, a needs to be a component when you think about decentralized clinical trials. I just wanna ask for clarification on something because there's a question down the line on hybrid trials. Is there a specific way that you guys define hybrid trials? 
not for us. And, and I, th I think that sometimes the trouble with definitions is the definition is, is really dependent on the trial itself and the sponsor. And so what, what we try to do is get into what's the need? What's the need that we're trying to solve and how are we trying to solve that? So at CureVit, we are running a trial that I think would be defined as hybrid because there's about 30 sites uh, into it. And we're adding a component of services for endpoint adjudication where we're collecting uh, video and audio, putting that into our cloud platform and having our remote-based audiologists do those scorings. And so, however, if you went to the sponsor and said, you are running a hybrid trial, I think that, that it wouldn't make any sense to them. They are running a trial and they're added an overlay of technology that happens to be a virtual site and do, doing endpoint adjudication, but the actual definition wouldn't mean much to the uh, sponsor. So that's why we try to stay away from it the global definitions and go more towards what's the sponsors need. Makes sense. We would, we would certainly agree at, at Medable in looking at, you know, what's the protocol fit solution that optimizes that study and the choices for sites and patients. So really looking, you know, hybrid, virtual, decentralized, you know, it can be any and all. And it, within a single study, you may have some patients choose to go traditional and some patients choose to, to be virtual or choose to have the option to, to be remote. So it's not a single one size fits all. It's really looking at what is, this, what is the scientific intent of the study and what is the safety profile of the study that allows us to provide which choice framework for getting the activities and the outcomes of the study completed um, and then allowing people to know what their choices are either at a local um, local level or maybe it's governed by a different geography and we're looking at what is the consistent way in which we can collect that data on a global basis for global registration studies. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. I'll tweak the question later down the line then. Um, that, so a decentralized trial may work better for some therapeutic areas versus others. That's at least my understanding. Um, are there specific therapeutic areas where you'd say, yes, a decentralized trial would work well here and maybe not so well in this area? Whoever wants to jump in. I'll maybe take the first crack. So basically with clinical trials, ultimately you're looking at endpoint data. So data that measures the efficacy of the drug that you're using. And so if you can gather those endpoints remotely or in a decentralized way so that the participant is in their home or wherever they are outside of the clinic, those trials lend themselves to the quote unquote decentralized trial because you don't need to be in the clinic to capture the important endpoints that are used to determine the results of the trial. Obviously, there's some therapeutic areas that are better for that. So, you know, survey-based um, trials or therapeutic areas such as depression, anxiety, sleep, things like that have lend themselves well. Uh, these, um, digital therapeutics are an interesting, and I know they're across different therapies, but that's an interesting modality. And then they really do leverage decentralized clinical trials as, as we know them. Allie? Yeah, and again, I think it comes back to, to protocol fit. What are we trying to solve for and improve? So actually we have over 50% of our studies running in oncology. Oncology, hugely complex, you know, very toxic, um, on, compounds that are being uh, delivered to patients, very complicated patient treatment pathways. We're not decentralizing and going virtual for the whole study, but when you think about the frequency and the burden and the impact of those studies on patients, if we can offset using uh, digital digital technologies, ePro, ECOAs, televisits, sensors, to allow those patients the choice to stay at home more frequently, so to alleviate the need to come in for every visit, then that's really powerful. We're running some studies where you know, we're looking for specific um, adverse event indicators um, and collecting those through a, a suite of diaries, um, assessments and sensors that allow real time reporting back to the clinicians at the site on objective data, high quality integrity data collected for 
about that patient that allows the site in real time to make a decision on whether the patient is safe to stay at home or they'd like to have a televisit with them because they're not liking where their blood pressure is going or where their temperature is going and allows them to make real time interventions that enable us to keep patients actually more safe in the study, um, actually maintain their uh, continuity in the study as well. So rather than patients dropping out because they're having a side effect or that something's happening, that they can have that real-time consultation and know that they're being overseen effectively from home. So I think there's a there's a balance every time we look at a protocol to say, what is it we're trying to solve for? We're definitely not just wanting to throw technology at it for technology's sake, but to say, what are we solving for? How can we improve the patient's experience? How can we amplify um, how the patient engages with their site? And how can we improve the integ integrity of the data that's being collected for the study? I'm glad you uh, used oncology as an example, because a lot of people think, oh, that needs to be, you know, at the research centers 100%. So it was, it was interesting to hear, um, hear you describe that. So let's get into some of the challenges. Obviously, COVID-19 was a catalyst for a lot of decentralized activity. Um, but in trial site reported on this a while ago, it's not as easy as flipping a switch, you know, taking a traditional trial and trying to decentralize elements of it. For example, I was reading about how sometimes adhering to protocols can be a challenge. But what, in your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have to overcome? I think it's like anything with change management. You plan, plan, and plan some more, and then you plan again after you've deployed it. So um, I think what we certainly learned during COVID-19 was you don't just throw everything out um, and see what sticks. I think that's what happened immediately. And of course that did because, you know, nobody had any pre-warning. We had to do whatever it took to, to try and maintain continuity for patients in studies. However, I think what we've learned is thinking about the consolidated user experience for the key stakeholders at the sites and the patients and thinking about what's the best solution set that makes sense to, to amplify that. Um, and then how do we support the change management around how we're deploying that? So how do we work with the sites to really look at what do they stop, start and continue doing in order to be inspection ready at all times, in order to manage the integrity of their data, in order to be compliant with the processes around. So 100% um, agree that it's not a flipping a switch and we have to put that planning effort and the investment effort in with the sites so that they can be best support their patients and that we can be responsive to understanding what makes them efficient and keeping up their productivity and what we can take off their plate by reducing administrative burden to eliminate some of the manual tasks. So, you know, I set up studies in the past where we might have had 15 different systems that a site had to log into. How can we consolidate that so that the site has fewer systems to use, the data actually is unified and streams between the systems? So, um, we have some workflows um, at Medable looking at how we engage a patient in e-consent, that generates the patient ID number, which pushes that to the IXRS, that generates the randomization number, that pushes that to the EDC, that sets up the patient profile. And you know that's a process that should be automated. We shouldn't need the site to have to go and enter the data in three different systems in order to get to that outcome. Yeah, one thing I saw with COVID that, that I thought was beneficial to to healthcare in general, and certainly to clinical trials going into decentralized formats is a mental shift in everybody who is a stakeholder in that ecosystem to recognize that there's new ways to do things and it might not be for everything. And to Ali's point, it needs planning, but you would actually now create groups that think about digital health and think about um, home-based engagement, where before, because pharmaceutical is very conservative and it should be because of patient safety, um, there, there, there was less of an, uh, a reason to do it. And I think that there has been a seismic shift in at least attitude and perception. That doesn't mean that you're going to flip the switch and do it, but that means that it's acceptable to plan it and actually to execute it. And so that's what we've seen um, and we've seen very companies embrace it because the protocol to Ellie's point matches a decentralized clinical trial or a great number of components. 
There's advantages, speed, cost, et cetera, and they embrace and run. We are working with other sponsors that are very thoughtful, putting together strategic teams, looking at individual problems that their trials have, looking at all ways to solve those problems, including the uh, components of decentralized clinical trials. So it's been, I think, a um, accelerant to get there where to have people start to really either embrace or plan. And it's not considered an outlier anymore. It's considered within the ballpark of what's acceptable to do. And that's been, that's been healthy. I wanted to, you know, they talk about health literacy, um, you know, for people to understand you know, certain th- facts about diseases, that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word here, maybe like tech literacy. You know, I'm thinking about decentralized trial. I'm thinking, well, people, there's, they're going to have to have a certain level of understanding, right, in terms of maybe how to uh, manage some kind of tech-related thing. Um, I, do you is that an issue that you've run into, or maybe even connections in some of the more remote areas? Like, oh, the Wi-Fi is down. You know, can't fill out my or send in my data today. Um, is, is that, has that been an issue either of you have experienced? I'll tell you, it's been a huge issue. So the, the concept of um, deburdening the patient, you're really shifting burden. And maybe there's lower burden. Some patients I think would argue there's significantly more burden by than me having to fill, figure out exactly the technology to use and how to fill out this survey. And, and one of the biggest things we've run into is now it's the patient in their home and or outside of the clinic. And so they have an appointment. Uh, you'd be a little surprised at the percentage of appointments that are missed because, and it depends on the trial. So how serious it is, you know, so if it's an observational trial that is pretty low in impact, you know, oh, I scheduled that, but I decided to go on a hike or I decided to do this. So I think that not only um, there's, there's definitely patient burden in the technology, no question about it. There's also patient burden in terms of being um, a different mode in terms of I need to manage my calendar like I do have a physical appointment seeing my doctor. And that's important. And we, we see a, a fair amount of slippage in that area. And there's a lot of extra activity to make sure that there's reminders sent out and people, you know, um, uh, keep their appointments because that's a, that's a bit of a challenge actually. Yeah. I think it comes down to understanding your patients as well and then designing for those patients. So there's definitely, you know, technical articulancy is, is greater in some populations than others. Um, and also there's familiarity with different, um, different modes of access as well. So, you know, we've, learned and put a lot of effort into investing to make sure that our capabilities are available on provisioned mobile devices, BYOD, which device are you most familiar with that you might use yourself already, and and web. So some some patients may be much more comfortable going to a web, web environment and completing it on any device that they have. Others might be much more familiar with just downloading an app on their phone and, and running with that. And it's about understanding you know who our patients are and then how we design the solution set to meet those patients so we've run studies in with cystic fibrosis patients where they're fairly young they're used to gaming on their phones they're they're hugely technically articulate and we've had great success with patient feedback on on that we've also had great success in um, older populations with age-related macular degeneration where um, we were uh, recruiting and remotely screening patients um, for a study in an entirely remote setting, including kind of shipping to them uh, cheek swabs for um, for genetic sampling and so on. You design the workflows differently. You you think about complexity versus ease. You think about how to make it really accessible, and then we think about well, where are our patients? And those patients who who might not even have access to a smartphone, um, who maybe they want to walk into a local community center and be able to use a web interface there that might enable them to have access. So we're thinking about how do we make clinical trials more accessible and, and by, by that also more diversely represented um, and putting the clinical trials out into the community as a treatment option by 
building awareness and removing the technology barrier for access. I'm not going to say it's perfect yet. It's a work in progress. But as we think about some of the collaborations that are going to help us with that and, you know, certainly um, one of the, the ways we're looking at that is a partnership with CVS. And if we've got a medical hub within the CVS hub, then anyone can walk in off the street and access and see that a clinical trial is available using technology that's set up in that hub in a community pharmacy based setting. So thinking about where people engage and where they might be and then how we want to um, help support them to see clinical trials as an option for how they participate in their healthcare go forward as well so that we improve inclusivity and we improve the accessibility for for people i say it the user friendliness is such a big topic today the, the minute something doesn't work on an app you're like i'm done with this so <laughs> you have to deal with well, it yeah and as Joel um, mentioned, you know, it's those notifications. Well, if my app bleeps at me too many times, what am I going to do? I'm going to delete it. So, you yeah. know, it's about that balance and understanding yeah. how do we motivate the best behavior versus switch people off completely. And yeah. so really doing your research and understanding the community that you're targeting and then what's the appropriate suite of capabilities to deploy. So my next question is about who joins these types of trials. Um, do you find that certain demographic demographic cohorts are more accessible for decentralized trials? I think trials in general have have had a challenge over the his, history of getting diverse population representation in into trials, um, and we saw that during the COVID vaccine studies as well getting diverse representation in there were some of the more challenging challenging cohorts to recruit into those studies but we have to per persevere and we have to improve i think what um dcts and decentralized trials can offer is more choice and putting the studies out in the community where there may be dif different trusted relationships that can help to improve accessibility. So that might be through a community pharmacist. It might be through um, a site network team. And as Joel has out there working with um, broader communities of patients to really help make sure that there are different in routes to the clinical trial for more populations of people who might find that accessible. We've still got a lot of work to do on uh, trust and transparency of clinical trials in general with the broader population. I think that that's different by different countries and geographies, um, but we're certainly not there yet in, in terms of everyone seeing that this is a, a transparent and um, trustworthy environment that everyone feels that they have accessible to them. Yeah, and the only thing I maybe add to that is um, we do see a lot of people joining where there's something in it for them and they're not necessarily the payments. So, you, you know, there's some payments go out to people that participate, but it's more, gee, I, I've been living with fibromyalgia for a very long time and I'm not getting any help. I notice that there's a trial. Let me go try that. Um, I have goals for weight loss or goals for heart health. This trial is saying that they can help me with those. So appealing to um, uh, audiences where there's there's something in it for them on top of the um, participation helps medical research. And so I think there's some people feel like they should participate just because of that. But you know, leveraging those type of um, drivers of what people join and then just because they're able to join from in a lot of the decentralized trials, because the burden of the site is removed, uh, you can recruit from all over the country. And so that has really, I think, been uh, tremendous. It's been tremendous in terms of taking cycle times off of recruiting, but also getting a population that is uh, spread across several geographies. I'm gonna come back to a question, a broader question about health equity, just because I think it's so important um, when it comes to research. Um, but I wanted to move on to wearables because it sounds like wearables uh, play or a, a role in decentralized trials. So what sort of wearables are you, are you seeing? Maybe you can give, share some examples. And what do you hope um, it does to the data? Do you want more data, more sophisticated data? Um, are you going to be able to get data that you wouldn't otherwise get, say, in a traditional trial? 
<laughs> we could spend another few hours on this one. So <laughs> we have time. <laughs> it's um, you know, when we think about wearables and what we're trying to to do with wearables, we're trying to um, collect accurate, high integrity data from people who are not sitting in front of us in a clinic. Um, and that might be that we're looking to do and take spot measurements remotely that people can provide those into the clinic or that we're looking to collect continual data to monitor patterns um, over time. We certainly from a medical perspective are working with a number of different wear wearables and have done so for, for many years now, um, looking at integrating those wearables into the, the participant experience on, on platforms. So um, as we deploy out a study, um, we set kind of the schedule of the study and the activities that are going to come up and the instructions and the, the um, guidance for patients that's um, embedded in the applications. But also then they might be provisioned with um, some sensors and that might be um, anything from um, a pulse oximeter um, that they put on their finger, Bluetooth onto their phone. So the task scheduler says, hey, your pulse ox is due. Could you kind of press this button? It'll check the Bluetooth connection, collect the measurement. The patient doesn't have to tra transcribe it. It automatically Bluetooths and uploads into the database where an the database is, is cloud-based, so then the investigator can see that in real time. Notification, hey, your patient's just completed their measurements. Do you want to have a look at them? You know, take any clinical actions that you, you need to do. So building those um, integrated wearables into the workflows to really make it a streamlined and really easy patient experience is great. I think we have also learned that there is a limit to how many sensors and wearables you can truly really expect a patient to tolerate. And so uh, to, to Joel's point earlier about not shifting the burden onto our patients, we're trying to make things easier. Um, we're trying to reduce transcription, we're trying to reduce manual effort, but we can't just have you know reminders going off every 20 minutes about please go and put your blood pressure monitor on, then please go and do this walk test and please go and do your ECG. And you, know, you, you have to look at what really, really matters and then pick the sensors that can do the maximum number of measurements in the most efficient and highest patient experience um, uh, framework. So we've chosen to select wearables that really focus in on kind of critical vital signs, um, blood pressure, temperature, mon um, ECG, um, sleep, um, activity, um, all of those that we want to have those choices on platform and know that we can collect that data, um, either as spot measurements or, and you mentioned continuous measurement, you can create an extraordinary volume of data very, very quickly with continuous data. You've kind of got to know what you're going to do with that in advance to know how you're going to analyze that data. Just because you have a ton of data doesn't necessarily make things better. You should be knowing what data you're going to collect, collect the data that matters for the objectives of the study and know how you're going to assess that data um, and then make sure that it can be collected in a high integrity way and provided to the right people to make the right clinical decision making uh, based on that data. So we've, we very much um, like to have wearables in decentralized clinical trials, not all the time, but a lot of the time they add extraordinary value, but you've really got to think about the patient experience of how that's going to work. And, you know, we're deploying um, wearables on studies in that are running, one study is running in over 45 countries. The logistics of getting those wearables to patients in 45 different countries and making sure we've got consistency and um, control around that takes a lot of logistics. So it's not things that you want to enter into without really knowing the high value of that data to the study outcomes. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add there is also a plan for you know, usability. Uh, it's shocking how, how um, every scenario you think you think of about how somebody could use something incorrectly, you miss five other things. You know, we were running a study where um, being vertical was important and the sensor could uh, understand if you were lying down or standing up. And then we had a group of patients that 
we thought were at risk because the sensor said that they were lying down. What happened was they put the sensor on their stomach, they were obese and their stomach went over. So it appeared that the uh, patient was lying down when they were actually- Oh my goodness. So it's- You wouldn't have thought of that one, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, um, and so it's just, they add a complexity in terms of usage and training. And then you also have to have a keen eye on the data and making sure that that data is coming in and being used correctly. And actually I listened to a podcast this morning by, you know, a PhD and um, something came out with a, with a pulse oximeter where the results were, were perfect. If you have skin like mine, if you were an African-American, it actually wasn't working. And then um, because of that, a patient in a hospital died, nothing to do with clinical trial, but the point is that, um, that some, some devices are a little bit trickier than others. And you have to really take a hard look at what devices you're using and the devices that Abby, I'm sorry, Ali mentioned were spot on, you know, that's what we use as well. I think there's an extraordinary amount of effort that goes into the selection of which devices, yeah. certainly from our perspectives, which ones do we want to offer? Because it's not just about the measurement and how it takes it, it's about how the data integrates, how the user experience is set up, the sustainability of that device over time. Some of these studies are going to run for multiple years, and so can that that device actually sustain? Is it medic- medical device grade approved? in all the jurisdictions that it's going to be used for if that's needed for the for the data collection of the study so there's an awful lot that goes into that and then the, there's the whole technical back end of how the data and how the integrations work as well it's um we have a whole team dedicated to doing this at medical because it it takes that it's not just a connection point it's really about mapping that end to end um assessment about what is it doing How is it doing it? What's the experience going to be? And how can we make sure that the data can get into the right people's hands to make the right clinical decision as well? There's no point in us having the data over in a silo here if the sites can't see it. And it's important to overseeing the safety of their patients. Now, when you talked uh, before about patient shifting the burden to patients, I was curious, have you noticed, um, is there any sort of burden shifting to the researchers or primary investigators uh, you know, do they have to learn new new technology? Um, do you find any pushback there, or is pretty much everybody in the field excited about this? Well, what we've seen is that researchers are actually quite excited. So, um, and a, a majority of our trials are actually siteless. So we run a, a virtual site, and so we have multiple PIs that um, join studies they couldn't otherwise be part of a study because their site is not set up. Their partners at the site don't wanna run clinical trials for a whole host of reasons. And so we give them access and democratize their access to being investigators on clinical sites. So we've seen a tremendous uptick in interest in PIs. And then when you mentioned the technology, this is technology, the genres they're used to using. So telehealth, Looking at EHR records, um, uh, you, you know, doing a doing a clinical outcome assessment over telehealth and th- things like that. So we haven't gotten any pushback on that per se, and it's been you know a, a huge what I would consider to be a huge net positive for the um, investigator community. I would agree. I and I think you know just to add to that maybe the the time you spend with the sites preparing the sites. You know, when you're setting up a study, it's a pretty frantic time, particularly around the time that you're getting your ethics committee approvals, you're shipping everything to site. The sites are pretty full on busy. Throwing in a piece of technology and the whole new workflow at that time point and just expecting sites to pick it up and run with it, that's never gonna really be a recipe for success. So, you know, we actually have a site success group that we have instigated to really coach the sites through what it takes for change management and to really make sure that they can be familiar with the technology in advance so that their first experience when the patient is sitting in front of them, be that physically in front of them or virtually on a screen in front of them, they're really confident about what they, how they're going to do this and how to use it. So I think, again, it's part of that planning and preparation cycle 
don't expect that this is just a natural kind of send it out and it will be done, but, you know, support everybody in terms of how to get the best experience from that. And then we find that the sites are hugely excited and very keen to engage. And we see that across the world. I, I saw some great feedback from one of our teams um, last month around uh, feedback from a site in Japan that they've been working with. They had translators in, involved as well. But the site re really appreciated the ability to have that one-to-one -one coaching about what they were going to do and how they were going to use the technology that meant that they were really confident when they were engaging with their patients and they've become one of the really successful sites in that country. All right. Um, I want to go back to health equity. Obviously, lots of people are talking about health equity it became a hugely important issue during COVID-19. People want to feel represented in clinical trials. When they look at, when they read the papers, they want to say, who was in this trial? It was someone like me in this trial. And uh, Ali, as you mentioned before, uh, it seems to still be a, an issue in traditional trials, re recruiting, getting a diversified uh, participants, diversifying participants in a trial. So can either of you comment on what is being done is, uh, in terms of trying to diversify clinical trials overall, and if there's specific examples, um, maybe even community issues that you can discuss. I know you mentioned a pharmacy, but just anything specific uh, that you have experienced. Uh, I'm certainly happy to, to comment on that and look at, you know, making clinical trials more accessible, more aware, and that people can see that they are an option. They have a choice about whether they wish to participate in it, but they only have a choice when they know about it in the first place. So how do we improve awareness and improve the um, the accessibility in the first place of knowing that a clinical trial is there? Unless you go to a clinician and really um, ask for clinical research, a lot of people don't even know that that's an option um, in their healthcare portfolio. So that's where we've really found going out to community-based practice, um, through sites, through um, through pharmacies, through uh, networks, working with the advocacy groups um, and the patient champion networks really has helped to improve the uh, visibility of clinical trials. And we work very much with a patient council. Medbull has its own um, dedicated patient council who help us with the design of that and looking at what would help us to promote this and make it an easy access um, and would add value to someone's participation in the clinical trial. So um, we then design the solutions um, from that perspective. So making sure that we're listening to the voice of patients around the world um, and using that to design our technology in the first place, and then thinking about that design and that patient voice as we deploy and design study level um, solution sets to say what what is the gap right now and what are we trying to solve for and how do we make this more visible more accessible and improve the choices it may be as simple as you know allowing people to screen and do those extensive screening visits if three quarters of that could be done at home um, so that when you go to the site only the last couple of activities need to be on site and you've reduced the time from two hours with maybe an hour's travel time each side um, so you've taken four hours out of a patient's day and reduced it down to just the activities that have to happen on site and allowed them the flexibility of being able to do that at home, particularly if they're a caregiver, they've got a young family, they're working full time, you know, allowing people the choice and letting them um, use technology that they're very familiar with for other aspects of their lives, such as, you know, their banking, their shopping, other, other components. We use our phones and our technology a lot. So why would we not allow that accessibility through here that improves um, the choices and improves the ease of which people can know if clinical trial is relevant for them? And I agree with all that. And some of the things that you've seen come out of the FDA are, are um, headed in the right direction. So they're laying out guidance and they would like trial participation to reflect the general population. And, and I think that that's important guidance for an industry that I think um, is, is keenly aware of their brands and how important having a solid brand is to, um, for their company, but also for the healthcare in general. So I, I think that's all you know, in the right direction, we would like to see 
uh, regulatory go further and not just make them guidance, but put some, some rules around it so that then when it comes to a situation where there's a budget impact and we have seen areas that, that you might be because you're trying to reach harder to find um, communities, communities that haven't been exposed to clinical trials before, that there is additional effort that we are finding that is required. And so there's some companies that are starting up that you know target that specifically, and we're working with them, but you will still see that there's a potential to have a budget impact. And I think what I'm suggesting is um, until there is some rules around that budget impact, a lot of companies won't opt to spend more money because they just don't have it and or that they maybe want to put it in other areas and that's an area that's good to have but not required and when you start to make it required i think you'll even see more improvements in the in this way so as what is typical in this industry is everybody walks towards a, a long-term goal this is definitely a long-term goal decentralized trials are helping because they're helping provide the access and then regulatory is helping push along so that you know people are guided into doing things that are best for the community. Um, so when you talk about regulations or you know the regulatory role that needs to happen and accessibility, uh, trust has been an issue. You know we've seen that during COVID nineteen, and I was I was curious. Does do you think uh, are there efforts being made to improve trust, whether it be you know, in traditional healthcare system or getting partic particular populations to sign up. You know, you might make something very accessible and then but there's just no trust there. Is In your experience, is that an issue? Is that being discussed? I think it's a huge issue. And given cure of its size and, and tenure, it's, it's bigger than us, if you will. So um, we recognize that there's some populations that, um, require you know, a, a tremendous investment in trust in order to participate. And that's not part of the activity that, that we're encountering. So we're, we're not community-based um, where a lot of that trust happens. We are working with some, um, some, some trials where uh, it, it is important to have a strong, um, you know, in this case, rural, uh, uh, underserved population, and we target that specifically, but that's a specific trial, not a, a, a large trial where we're trying to segment it out. So when it's a specific goal, it has specific funding and targets, that actually tends to work the best. And, and usually in those cases, the element of trust is something that is addressed through training, through you know, engagement with community people, through that type of you know, focus. Yeah, I I think we're, we're seeing also um, a lot of focus on how do we how do we work with our sponsors to really put the patient's voice much more vocally um, and emphatically into the clinical trial design. I think we've talked about patient centricity extensively for many, many years um, and, and really been pretty ineffective about it. But what we're starting to see is a much more effective in view of engaging patients directly into clinical trials, be that helping with greater information sharing um, right up front in the clinical study. So we're looking with, um, with consenting, e-consenting. It's not just collecting a digital signature. It's about improving the comprehension and the knowledge transfer to patients of what they're signing up for. What are the study schedules? What are, is going to be expected of them? How long is this going to continue? What is going to happen over time? And what are their choices? And allowing them the ability to have that presented in multiple different medias. Maybe there's FAQs and tables and diagrams and, and videos and media embedded into that consenting experience and added to that the really high value discussions that can happen with the clinicians then around 
ensuring that comprehension and that knowledge so that then we have better informed patients coming into the clinical trial who really then are sustaining through the clinical trial because they knew the expectations better. They had greater awareness of what was going to happen. I think there are plenty of studies that have been done around, you know, the challenges of, of informed consent generally in clinical trials. And what we have is the ability with technology to change that and look at how do we make sure that we can use the media, multimedia sources that are available to improve that comprehension and improve the engagement experience up front so that it has that knock on all the way through the trial. So I think there are many different ways in which we're looking at addressing that trust piece um, and making sure that information is presented in ways that can be um, ingested and um, comprehended much better and much more transparently. And then that we keep that live. We're, we're at seeing a lot more sponsors now wanting to keep an engagement level with patients beyond the clinical trial to actually tell them what's happened in the clinical trial post more newsletters out to be able to have the ability to tell patients what happened as a result of their participation in the clinical trial and previously when you know the sponsor and the patient were completely remote and they finish the patient finishes in the clinical trial and then goes back into the general population it was very hard to maintain that whereas now with technology we can actually push newsletters out and have patients opt in to um, receive newsletters and updates post the end of the study so that we can try and improve some of that appreciation for what they have done during the clinical trial it wasn't that they were unappreciated before we just didn't express it very well before because we didn't have so many uh, mechanisms to connect with them yeah, I mean, building trust always goes back to communication um, and helping people to understand um, the science and making it less fearful, more understandable. Uh, and along the lines of trust, I have two more questions for you guys, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, data privacy is a huge issue. Um, do you run into anything specific with decentralized trials when it comes to making sure the data is private. You know, if I did wanted to join a trial, I'd be like, oh, I want to make sure that my data is going to be private, not get hacked into, sent anywhere. You know, this app is secure. Um, how do you go about that? And certainly from a, from a technology perspective, it's absolutely foundational to um, our platform and how we've set that up. So it has, you know, in order to, to for patients around the world to trust that and, you know, for investigators and and regulators and ethics committees to approve it we've got to show that we operate to those highest highest degrees of rigor so you know being compliant with gdpr with um with um ichgcp with uh cfr 21 part 11 compliance all of those regulations that exist out there, we need to make sure we're at minimum compliant to and exceed those compliance levels around the world as we know, you know, not everything is consistent around the world. So we would rather conform to the highest level of standard around the world. And that's why, you know, we would, we have made it a point with the Medible platform to have every single part of the platform conform to those platform standards and all of our modules. So, um, if you do a televisit on platform, it's not a Zoom bolt-on. It sits within the secure framework of the platform and meets those security standards so that it can be deployed with any of the other modules on platform. So we spend a lot of time looking at that and making sure we can be compliant and then also helping educate people as to what does that mean. Um, if you're doing a televisit, it, there isn't a replica that stays in the memory of your phone, um, that images captured do not sit within the memory of the phone or, or device if it's a shared family device. So um, there's a lot of education that has to happen around that, around how we maintain that security and that privacy in order to maintain uh, compliance and the trust that the patients are, are placing in us, that we, we have those standards in place. And the only thing I would add is I think that probably there's a slice of population that we're just not going to get because you know there's there's daily reminders that trusted uh, systems fail and i think that uh, all the all the protocols that uh, ali talked about that ensures that you know our systems stand up to that we're not doing trials without it but still i've had and i'm sure you have too ali several conversations with patients that just say 
I just don't buy it because I know that you guys are doing the right thing. But I just got a letter from my insurance company. They were hacked. I got a letter from my hospital. They were hacked. Uh, um, and that's just actually real life examples for me personally in the last two months. And so I, I think that there's a group that, um, that, that we're going to, the early adopters of the people that we're going to, to get in, recognize that there's some risk in that and are willing to take the risk for the advantages. But um, unfortunately, it's, there's, there's not, there's, um, privacy is a challenge, uh, I think. And I think there's a lot of people that have um, maybe even given up on it. So as sad as that sounds. No, I mean, I, I think that's a good point because people, I mean, and some people in the population feel very, very strongly about privacy and won't, you know, won't do anything. Whereas other people are, you know, more, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do this. And some people are like, I don't care if anyone even knows that about me. So it's, you're dealing with all different personalities for sure. Um, I want to thank you guys both for this conversation. I think it was very helpful. It'll help a lot of people understand decentralized clinical trials better. So thank you for your time. I, my last question really is, where do you guys see decentralized trial, the state of decentralized clinical trials, say in the next five years? Well, I think that there's a tremendous amount of work being done trying to define the advantages and uh, of decentralized clinical trials and work with the with the the general community to actually get that information out. And there's so much good that can come from reinventing clinical trials. And that doesn't mean that everything needs to be decentralized or everything needs to be one way, but to add innovation and process improvement and you know patient engagement uh, improvement, I think can only help. And so I tend to be very bullish that in five years, you're going to see dramatic improvements in clinical trials. Some of those improvements will come from the efforts that are happening in decentralized, but will manifest themselves in other places. So all the work being done here, whether it's just for decentralized or broadly improving clinical trials, I think that you're going to start to see some real step function improvements and, and gains in the effectiveness, efficiency, you know, et cetera, and ultimately the cost of developing new life-saving, you know, helpful drugs will hopefully turn that corner and go down. So I'm, I'm very optimistic, obviously. <laughs> I share that optimism. So uh, I think, you know, what we've shown over the last couple of years is what's possible. Now we have to look at what makes it consistent and scalable and reproducible time after time after time. So we really get to the crux of reducing some of those massive cycle times, reducing some of that complexity that has driven up drug development time and drug development cost over the last few years, almost to an unsustainable level. So from our perspectives, we we have a, a five-year kind of one one-on-one -on -one strategy, a goal that in five years' time, a study could be stood up in a day, recruited in a month, and completed in a year. What would that need to do? What would we need to do in order to facilitate that to happen? We would need to be acquiring data differently. We would need to be thinking about our patients differently, trial ready patients rather than patient recruitment. Thinking about how do we um, make the study more visible so that everyone knows what's available in there libraries of endpoints, libraries of capability um, that can just be pulled off the shelf and deployed um, that meet the needs of standard protocols and standard outcome assessments and standard outcome measures. And then also that um, that data doesn't sit in a silo, not with us or with anyone else. It's fully integrated across the ecosystem of all the people who need it and all the systems that it has to flow to so that it's available for real-time decision-making, not only by the clinicians, but by the study designers and the study oversight team and the safety teams around different cohort managements and cohort decisions to mean that we can really accelerate um, the progress and the um, the treatment uh, timelines during a clinical trial to utilize real-time data in, in, an, in a way that just hasn't been accessible to us before. So it's a big aspirational goal. 
we're not there today, um, but that's definitely where we're anticipating going. And it's uh, the North Star that guides us as to what we should be doing and investing in over the next five years to really try and transform how drug development is done and how technology can play a really leading role in offering a different way of, of achieving those goals. So lots of optimism, which is good. You um, optimism. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, to, I think, too, uh, going back to like building trust and informing people, it goes back to kind of uh, cultivating transparency. So I do appreciate both of you taking the time to come on trial site to make the process more transparent so people can understand it a little more. Um, research is kind of one of those areas that, you know, if you're not in science, you just don't really know much about it. So um, this was very, this was helpful. So thank you to you both. And thank you to everyone, all of our trial site news readers and listeners for joining in today.